It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Today, my guest is CEO Sirhat Unsal. Surat is the Chief Executive Officer of Don Foods, where he joined in 2011. As President of International from 11 to 16, he led Don's global growth in the company's key European markets, along with emerging markets in Asia, Middle East, and Latin America prior to assuming the corner office. Before that, he spent 18 years with Unilever, where he started his career as a project manager, and he earned a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Cincinnati and an MBA from the University of Toronto. Sarad Sal, welcome into the corner office. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here, Brent. Great to have you here. And, uh, you know, we always kind of like to start our pod with uh, a little bit of background in terms of those early years. And I know you've got a very fascinating uh, uh, international career uh, and international origins as well, as I know, uh, from our brief discussion before starting our podcast. So maybe you can just start and tell us a little bit about the early years, you know, where you grew up and what your early family life was like. I grew up in a very happy middle class family in Istanbul, Turkey, and, and my dad was a humble lawyer. And my mom was an elementary school teacher. And I have one brother, 10 years older than me. And, and my dad was the ultimate introvert who, who would speak very little. And my mom is the ultimate extrovert <laughs> who, who Good loves match. being around people. She would love connecting with them. And I remember when I was a child, we used to take this two-hour ferry, ferry ride to our summer house close to Istanbul. And during that two hours ride, she would become friends with the entire population of passengers, <laughs> exchanging phone numbers and stuff. So they, they, they were so different. But, but in my family, being creative, being artsy and fun were valued a lot. And, and music and singing was a common hobby for almost all family members. And there was everything at home to be a happy child, to be honest. So I consider myself very lucky from, from that perspective. That's awesome. Parents were professionals then. Did they attain higher degrees in, in Turkey? They did actually. They they um they were not business oriented, you know, lawyer and teacher, but uh yep, they, they had uh, high degrees. And what about your brother? That's quite a big age gap. I also have a brother that's ten years older than I and you know, I know I looked up to him a lot and uh you know, he was a role model for me. Did you have that kind of a relationship? Absolutely. I always tell him that I, I feel like I had two fathers and you know, <laughs> yeah. when looking looking for pocket money, it came very handy. <laughs> <laughs> when you ran out of your reserve with dad, you could always go to Big Brother, right? Absolutely. And he's uh, he's just like me, is a mechanical engineer, and his master's is also in mechanical engineering, and uh, he's always been a great inspiration for me as as a brother. Now, did your family, uh, your your uh, nuclear family, all uh, immigrate to Turkey, or or did that happen with you and later in life? No, I mean, um, we. I, I was born and raised in Turkey, and I, I was there until uh, 28, 29 oh, years old. So went through all your education there. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. So I'm I'm both Turkish and Canadian as citizenship, and throughout my life, I lived in four countries. I lived in Turkey, obviously. I lived in Canada. I lived in the U.S. and I lived in the Netherlands. Wow. So awesome. The question of where are you from? I, I always say, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Speak a climb beach in the Netherlands? Yeah, actually. <laughs> absolutely. And, and, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. I kept in, uh, in Amsterdam gewoon ook. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> for our non Dutch readers and listeners, we won't uh, pursue that further. But uh, did you did you work there or were you were you studying in Holland? 
I, I did work there actually. I was working uh, at Dawn at the time, so uh, it's funny that Unilever is a Dutch company. I never worked in the Netherlands with Unilever, but you know, after Unilever, I came to to the Netherlands with Dawn, and I was the uh, president of Dawn's international business for uh, for uh, yeah more than hundred countries managed out of Netherlands. Well, I'd love to get some insight into your early years because growing up in Turkey is unique. We've had, uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, probably about 10% of uh, participators in our pod have been international, um, you know, executives who grew up in, in countries and, and immigrated, some when they were early on in their careers and others like you after their education. So tell us a little bit about, you know, growing up, uh, you know, what, who were some of the early influencers uh, in your life beyond your parents? Did you have, you know, coaches or teachers that that were significant growing up in Turkey? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I I had some teachers, high school teachers, who had great influence on me. And um, I can, I can, I, and when I think about my early years, I, I always go back to my uh, years in the drama club. Oh, is, right. <laughs> <laughs> Pursuing your mother's uh, extroversion, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, my, my brain goes back and forth between that, the mom's side and the, and the dad's side, probably on the mom's side. I took leadership roles in the drama club. I wrote plays. I played myself, mostly comedy, by the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, that in, in that drama club, I got a lot of influence from uh, some of the instructors and, and some of my friends who were there as well, from my peers. And, and then I was building model planes and flying them. So um, I, my, my brother had, had a friend who taught me how to do that, and I loved it. And uh, by the way, I have a gr- great story about that. After building several successful model planes, and you know, I thought I gained enough experience and insights into building models and designing my own models. So one summer, I built this cruise ship, you know, <laughs> like totally my design. And um, I was into engineering in a way. I did that. I painted, beautiful looking. And I thought I got it all right and put it on the sea. And the first, <laughs> during the first uh, cruise, the ship sank, <laughs> which, <laughs> which reminds me of another famous ship. <laughs> exactly. You didn't name it the Titanic, I hope. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. <laughs> Only after. Only after. <laughs> oh, great stuff. What about school? Were you a good student? I was actually. I, w- I was a very good student, maybe to the extent of being borderline nerd. Okay. And uh, fr- from elementary school to master's, I-, I graduated with honor degrees from my schools, and I enjoyed learning. And and I especially like the analytical classes, like math and physics and chemistry. So uh, it, I, I remember as a 10-year-old kid, for the spring break, I went one, once to this beautiful Mediterranean resort with my parents. And, and instead of enjoying the resort, I studied most of the time because I, I had that huge sense of responsibility and wanted to be successful. And it's funny that my parents tried to persuade me otherwise. So things were a little upside down in my family. Turning it down a little bit, yeah. My my dad was an educator as well, first a teacher and a principal. And, you know, education, I'm sure, because of your mom's background, I'm sure was a very important part of, you know, the emphasis as you grew up. Huge, huge. Other than uh, the drama involvement, any other outside activity, sports, music, uh, anything else that you got involved with as a kid? Yeah, I mean, like like any young boy after school, I was I was playing playing sports. I liked basketball, tennis, soccer, but I wasn't very talented in sports, if I'm very honest. So um, I was more focused on reading books, reading encyclopedia, which I still do, and solving college-level math problems with my brother. Wow. So <laughs> that, that so I, I got a lot into the more cerebral part of uh, my, my, my uh, activities, but also, you know, a lot of sports, obviously. But I love I loved music. I come from a very music oriented family. What uh, uh, instruments did you play, or did you sing? Well, I, I I used to sing together with my brother, who was a fantastic singer. But I uh, I played the recorder. That's actually one of my uh, one of my hurts in life because because it was all around me. Music. I didn't pay enough attention to specializing in learning a specific instrument like a piano or a guitar. It was like no big deal, but I regret it today. And actually, it's one of my projects, if I can, given my business schedule, to learn how to play the piano together with my daughter. 
you know, growing up in America, kids typically do entrepreneurial things. You know, they'll have the ubiquitous paper route. Perhaps your children, you know, pursued some of those things or selling, you know, mistletoe at Christmas time. Uh, was that part of the culture? Were there things that were entrepreneurial during your elementary or high school days or, or, or not so much in Turkey? It was. I mean, it's it's a very trading culture. But because my, my parents were not business oriented, I wasn't necessarily raised with a huge business awareness in the family. But there must be something somewhere in my genes that <laughs> I was skip a generation or two, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, I, I was tr trading and selling comic books. Ah, cool. Was that in elementary school, high school? In elementary school, in middle school, uh, high school. So I was just, you know, buying some rare books and selling them at a higher price, etc. So it was, ah, it was came uh, too early. <laughs> and and, and I, I did a lot of tutoring for mm -hmm. uh, pocket money, and I I made a lot of money in my small world and uh and later in and not high school but later in college years i also worked in a pizza store as a delivery boy all right all right we share that commonality as well <laughs> oh you do all right great. that's great for the tips right great oh for the yeah tip. I, mean, I, I always delivered my pizza on time in full and uh but joking aside the, the, the pizza job actually taught me a lot about leadership and the team dynamics and customer service absolutely and i when it was raining, I would, you know, turn my cap upside down, fill it with water. And right before I ring the bell, I would put the hat on. So water is running down my hair. And <laughs> here's your pizza, sir. Oh, I so, love it. Yeah, I love it. That's $20, $20 minimum. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, in the earlier years with your comic books and, uh, you know, the tutoring, uh, did, did you save your money knowing that someday, you know, you might uh, have a big purchase? Did you, uh, you know, spend it on other activities as you went? You know, how, how did you kind of manage your, your entrepreneurial winnings, so to speak, in those early days? Actually, that's a, that's a great question, which reminds me that I, I've saved that money and I bought myself a stereo system, ah, which, you know, connects to my love for music. Sure, music. And it was a big thing at the time. And CDs were just coming out and, you know, from uh, the, the, the cassettes to CDs. And uh, I, I really loved my, my music uh, system that I bought with my pocket money. And then built the collection behind that, I'm sure. Absolutely. I still have them. <laughs> Fantastic. And then, um, uh, you know, again, again, not not uh, uh, comparing cultures, but, you know, it's it's very common, of course, kids going to school, college, undergraduate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, graduate degrees, you know, having jobs that might help fund the education. I'm not sure exactly in Turkey whether that was something that was nationally funded or privately funded. But did you you know, work during high school and college? Were there jobs that, that you had that helped support your education or perhaps additional spending uh, habits, so to speak? Yeah, well, um, actually, it's it was all state paid at my time. So, uh, so it's similar to Europe in that respect. Exactly. It's very European, the systems. I mean, today, it's more private and, and state paid kind of mixed, uh, but I didn't have to. And, and culturally, I mean, making a little bit of pocket money was okay, but if I was like really looking for, you know, uh, some income to, uh, to, to, to survive, that wouldn't look good on my parents. So that, that was the culture. When I told my parents that I'm in the U S in a pizza store delivering pizza, they said, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You should be focusing on studies. Right? Exactly. Which, uh, which actually, I mean, that, that, that experience taught a lot and, 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 uh, absolutely was very valuable. So uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees, from what I gather, and, and did those both in Turkey? Was it a combination of uh, domestic as well as some international learning? Tell me a little bit about those educational years, uh, tertiary education. I, I finished a few universities. Uh, I mean, my undergrad is in mechanical engineering in Turkey from the Bos Bosphorus, yeah, Bosphorus University, which was one of the top institutions. And then uh, I got my master's degree from the University of Cincinnati in artificial intelligence and robotics, which uh, is crucial for selling cakes right now, which is what I do. But uh, uh, then I did get my MBA from the University of Toronto from Rotman School of Business. So those are the uh, educational moments I had. What years were you in Cincinnati? I wonder if we overlapped during my Procter & Gamble time. It was uh, between 90, 1990 and 93. 
Yeah, I think I just missed you. I, I left there in '89, so uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a great town to live in. It gets a hard knock because of its Midwest location, but I enjoyed my years in Cincinnati. Okay, I, I remember when I first arrived the first year, Cincinnati has got the World Series in baseball. That's right, and never happened again as first. Yeah. Time. <laughs> <laughs> so mechanical engineering, you know, dad was a lawyer, mom was a school teacher. You know, what what led you to that uh, that that area of study? Actually, my my brother was a mechanical engineer, and uh, he wanted to be a doctor. But uh, during the SAT equivalent exam, he scored too high, so he went into <laughs> because of the system at the time. He went to a school that he didn't want and became a mechanical engineer, and he's been my inspiration uh, all along. And I thought that that's the right thing to do. So um, I don't know if I would be a mechanical engineer again, although I enjoyed the uh, the analytical side of the mechanical engineering education. Now, one of our sons is uh, also an ME and has gone to work for Ford, and he's now with a startup in the uh, electrical vehicle battery uh, storage area. And, and you know, it's it's well beyond my capabilities, but it's a fascinating area and an area in which, uh, you know, you really use your brain. It's a combination of science and, you know, working across a, a number of different areas. Did you um, work in the field then as well in mechanical engineering at some point in time? Um, very little, actually. I mean, um, I, I tried to get some jobs in, in uh, robotics and mechanical engineering. And my first experience in, in, in Unilever, I spent about 18 years in Unilever. And the first job was kind of an engineering job. It was a project manager job where I was managing the execution of big investment projects in one of the plants in, in Unilever, Turkey. But I wouldn't exactly call it engineering, which which was very early in my career, like the first year or two. And then I was a sales and marketing person and general management most of my career. And was there some gaps between the time that you received your undergraduate and then your graduate? Or did you you know, kind of do those back to back? They were back to back. And as soon as I finished my, uh, my master's, I got hired by, by Unilever. So you know, two companies, Unilever and then Dawn in my career. So quite simple. And did uh, uh, Unilever recruit at your campus or what led you to uh, joining them? Well, in, in early 90s, after my master's degree in Cincinnati, I went back to Turkey. And in those years, Procter & Gamble and Unilever were the two companies that were very admirable. I mean, they were paying very high. They were teaching a lot of things. So people were aspiring to be in those companies. So I applied to a to Unilever. Uh, I think it was a it was a newspaper ad. I thought I would never hear from them again because they didn't call me like for two months. And then one day I received a call, and it was uh, it was the call. <laughs> and then I stayed there for eighteen years. So, uh, Srat, you were telling me that your first job uh, out of college was with Unilever. Uh, was it in the mechanical engineering field? Well, um, it, it was kind of. It was an engineering job. Um, what I did was I was a project manager in one of the, the manufacturing plants of Unilever back in Turkey. And uh, I was kind of managing the big investment projects at the time. But that lasted like for a year or two. And after that, I was primarily in sales, marketing and general management. Awesome. Did they give you some leadership responsibilities early on? They did, actually. I mean, that was one of the things that I, I really uh, admire. Uh, even as of today, w uh, about Unilever, that they really trust you. They give you that responsibility. And, and I learned quite some uh, early lessons early in my career about leadership. Do you remember the first time you had people reporting to you? What was that job? Well, I, I learned quickly in that job that people are, are different and different things motivate them. So each person in the team wants to be approached differently. Like some people, I, I realize they like a pat on the back. Some people love to debate endlessly and want to challenge you and some want to be left alone. So everyone is different. So um, actually, I remember one of my you know, early team members in that job was very difficult and always wanted to talk about how it will not work. And I used to sit down with him and listen for a while. And, and then after a while, he would get finally exhausted and, and talk about how it may work. And... Um, People are different, and it's the leader's job to communicate and connect with different styles at the end of the day. 
were you managing people that were significantly older than you? I know that Proctor, you know, typically does that if you come into those positions and you have folks that, you know, have been there for a longer period of time or, or were you managing peers of the same age level? Yeah, ab- absolutely. They were much older than myself. And um, I mean, that that was good in many ways because I, I quickly learned that respect was at the center of leadership. So you have to respect the people around you, your team, your customers, your suppliers, and your competitors for that matter, and, and recognize them all for what they do. And at the end of the day, you know, I learned everyone is equally good. I mean, they just excel in different things and people have different capabilities. And, and as a leader, it's your job to match work at hand to the talent at hand. And how many years were you at Unilever? I was a to- there for a total of 18 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. So you left at a fairly senior level. What What were some of the best uh, or worst uh, lessons that you learned from previous bosses there? Oh, <laughs> I think the... Uh, you don't have to mention any names. That's okay. <laughs> no, no, ab- absolutely. I mean, a, a lot of the things that I, I learned probably shaped how I think about leadership. And uh, I think I learned being open and transparent and inclusive with my team. So this allows them to know what what's going on at any given time, and then this enables them to contribute more to decision-making. And uh, I believe that a team that can think and act together is a stronger team than a command and control team. So I was very lucky to work with some leaders that were fantastic in what I would call circular leadership rather than hierarchical leadership. So uh, I I learned quite a bit. And uh, I also had some managers that were micromanaging. And I don't believe in that at all myself. And I, I believe in delegated power rather than centralized power. So uh, I believe that un- unleashes the energy of people into the organization. It engenders trust and that creates that culture of shared accountability. So, um, I mean, both good and bad, I had some fantastic examples that shaped my leadership style. And some wonderful experiences, too. I, I imagine that Unilever, as with Proctor in my experience, moved you around quite a bit. Did you have uh, assignments in Europe as well as the U.S. during your 18 tenure there? Actually, I, I worked in within Unilever. I worked in Turkey and I worked in Canada. So In Canada. Got it. Yeah, I never had to move to any other country in Europe during my, my Unilever tenure. But as I said, I, I, I worked in Netherlands with Don after I left Unilever. So what was that first job when you left Unilever to join Don? I joined Don as the vice president of Europe. And at the time, uh, we were going through a major acquisition and we were about to make the acquisition. So I joined Don and a few months later, we made the acquisition. So pretty much my first job was to integrate this new acquisition into the existing company, which happened to be three times larger than the existing company in Europe at the time, yes. So that must have been quite a challenge. What what was some of the, you know, kind of the most challenging part of that integration? You know, sometimes cultures can be quite different between countries. What what, what was the kind of single biggest uh, challenge you had in that integration period? Absolutely. I mean, I think the single biggest challenge was we acquired a company that was larger than ours in Europe, at least. So they thought their their frame of mind, their thinking, their culture was the primary culture. And we thought, well, we're acquiring you. So our culture is the main culture. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So it was, uh, you know, the, the, the terminology was different. The recognition programs were different. The cultural cues were different. So everything was different between two companies. Not that one was good or the other was bad. But it was just different, and people had different frames of mind. They looked at the same problem but through different lenses. So the biggest challenge was to basically align the team to look at the same issue with the same eyes so that we can come up with creative solutions. Yeah, yeah. Respect, but also be able to kind of guide. Did, did you lose a lot of people during that transition? Were there people that decided that they did not want to be a part of the new company? Um, not, not a lot. I mean, there, there were a few, obviously there's, there's always that kind of attrition in in this kind of process, but nothing big. I mean, a lot of the great people that came to our company with that acquisition are still with our company and, and, and they're doing a, a fantastic job. And now we all speak the same language and we go back to those days sometimes and laugh. And, uh, (laughs) but at the end of the day, I think we, we achieved a, a pretty, uh, you know, unique integration 
through the power of two companies. And uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, your career at Dawn. So how long have you been in the corner office? Well, I've been in, the, in, in this job the last three years. Three years, so, right. Uh, yes. And did you go directly from the head of Europe to that position or were there some opportunities in between? What I have done is from the uh, VP of Europe job, I went into a um, the, the leader of Europe, Africa, Middle East and Asia Pacific job. And then Latin America was added to that. And I became the uh, head of international. I, I was the president of international. And at the same time, I was acting as the chief strategy officer of the company. So building the corporate strategy for the next five years. Got it. So reporting to the CEO in the last position prior to taking it over. Yeah. So yeah. Carrie Barber, who is my partner now, I used to report to Carrie before I joined this job. And uh, at the end of the say, day, the Carrie and the board said, you know, you cooked it. Come and eat it now. <laughs> <laughs> A good analogy for your business. And uh, you had mentioned 18 years at, at uh at uh, Lever, great company. How many years have you now been at Don? It's been eight years, five years uh, international and last three years in, in this job. How would you say your leadership's really evolved over time, particularly during these years of senior leadership management at Don? Yeah, I mean, I I think, uh, well, I'm, I'm getting older as a person, so I'm getting more mature. <laughs> Amazing how that happens. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been fighting that, but time is, time is moving on. Um, I, th I think the ba the basics that I built are still applicable in the sense that, you know, that, that openness, that transparency that I believe in is I'm trying to apply this everywhere that, you know, uh, I, I, I have an opportunity to lead. And um, again, the delegated power, the uh, giving the, the power to the team members and, and allowing them to decide and do things without checking with the boss is an important thing is an important feature that I'm trying to integrate into the new thinking. And and also, um, I mean, I, I learned early on that, you know, you have to ask yourself question, the question of why should anyone be led by you, right? Why should anyone care or follow? And what value do you provide as a leader? And I learned that as a leader, you must create a shared vision, a purpose, a community, which everyone willingly wants to be part of. And and find their personal stories in that shared purpose. And people want to be led by you if you help them achieve their personal aspirations. So that's uh, what I'm trying to do. I have uh, examples of having done that in my previous jobs. Um, in, in, in this job, we're building towards that. I still um, you know, have some more mileage to go. Uh, but like in my previous job in <clears throat> Unilever, Turkey, I remember... We were selling culinary ingredients to uh, professional chefs, ingredients like bouillon, spices, seasonings. And, and we created a shared mission that was about introducing international tastes to Turkish cuisine and introducing Turkish tastes to international cuisine, like creating almost like a you know culinary ambassadorship and sell innovative products. And while doing that, become the fastest growing division in Europe. And, and this mission, this journey motivated the team beyond their daily job or their salary or, or, or the, you know, let's say the, uh, the mechanics of the, of the job. And, and guess what? We became the fastest growing business two years in a row. So uh, that is important to align in a global job. Uh, it's obviously more complicated than a single country. That's why it's taking more time. But that is the direction that we're trying to take. We touched a little bit on company culture when you talked about the integration in Europe. How important is it for you as CEO to really be working on a, a continued development of the company culture? Or do you feel that Don Foods is at a stage where, you know, it's pretty much set and you're, you're kind of following the, you know, the leadership of the past as it relates to that, that specific mission or vision of the company? The culture is absolutely one of the most critical uh, ingredients of being successful. And, and we're lucky to work in a company that has a very good, very successful culture. And the best way to describe our culture is probably to say it's a it's a please and thank you company. So the basic kindness and, and positive attitude is at the center of the culture. So we want to protect that and we want to nurture that. That's very important. But at the same time, we need to recognize and realize the fact that our competitive battleground is changing. 
So in the past, it was more about personal relationships. I mean, today it's more about systems, ITs, and and you know, a more more complicated uh, marketing and sales solutions and and manufacturing technologies. But in the near future, it's going to become more digital AI. We're actually almost there. So when that happens, the whole company needs to think, behave, and act in a very different way. So we shouldn't we shouldn't lose who we are. You know what we do. That's very important, and we're very proud and lucky to have that. But we also need to add on top different habits, like different risk taking, like different different ways of interacting with each other. Maybe being okay with making mistakes and moving on to the next opportunity. So there's a different way of thinking that we need to adapt ourselves to. Well, it sounds kind of more like evolution than revolution. Absolutely, absolutely. That 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 is good to say. What do you look for when you're making bets on the people you invest in to hire? That's a great question because at the end of the day, I believe going forward in the next 50 years, I may or may not be here, but in the next 50 <laughs> years, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm eating healthy and doing a lot of exercises. <laughs> Good, but exercising still, regularly. <laughs> yes, still don't make a bet on it. But uh, in the next, let's say, 50 years, I, I believe we're a bakery company, we're a foods company. I believe we can find uh, sugar, we can find flour, we can find shortening to make our products, we can find everything. But I'm really worried about finding the right people at the rate of growth. So um, this is why it's very important we have the right people. And and some of the things that I look for is a high EQ, emotional intelligence, because at the end of the day, people deal with people at work and, and understanding the emotional environment in which you operate and understanding your own feelings objectively and understanding the feelings of others accurately and showing empathy. These are critical to achieve success. So that's what one of the things. The other thing I'm looking for is, because it's in, in, in line with our culture, that kindness and positive attitude. So, some of the most successful business people I know are extremely kind, and they have a positive attitude towards life. So being kind and po- positive doesn't mean that it's an inability to make tough decisions or or being unrealistically optimist. But it means... You know, you have the ability to prevent business issues from being a bad influence on your personal behavior. I look for judgment, the ability to judge, because it's difficult to teach judgment. It's one of those things that people are born with it or not, you know, uh, and, and, and people with strong judgment can make clear choices when the road forks. And the bigger we get, the more people with good judgment skills we need and, and willingness to learn, I will mention also, which is, quite important when nobody knows everything. And even if we do, our environment is changing so rapidly. The competition, technology, the the environment around us is constantly evolving at a speed we've never seen before. So in order to survive and thrive in this kind of an environment going forward, one must be curious and enjoy learning new things constantly. That fuels the growth of the company, in my view. You touched on something that reminded me of the story of John Nordstrom, who was the son of the founder, who, you know, was really behind the exponential growth, particularly in the 80s and 90s. And one time he was asked, as you know, Nordstrom's is known for their great customer service. Um, It was asked, you know, how how do you develop people? You know, what do you do? How do you train them? How do they, you know, have that level of customer service? And he looked them kind of quizzically and said, you know, we don't train and develop them. They were raised that way. Right. And it kind of gets back to that issue that you mentioned about good judgment. You either have it or you don't. (laughs) And if you can recruit against that, that's a very important uh, part of your DNA, particularly in a please and thank you culture, as you've explained it. Absolutely. You know, I'm sure you get involved in the hiring of, of your direct reports as and when you have those changes. What about further down the line? You know, do you get involved in any of the interviewing with maybe second level below you in, in the organization, particularly as you've gone through fast growth? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, definitely the direct reports as a hiring manager, I get involved, but also I get involved in the next layer down. And in our company's philosophy, uh, the vice presidents, who are two layers down from the CEOs, are also part of CEO's you know, uh, talent pool. And we're responsible for recruiting the right person personally and, and developing their career. So uh, I get involved a lot and I have my different techniques to interview people. 
which doesn't probably uh, fit to HR's recommendations of how to interview them. <laughs> Tell us about those. I mean, maybe an example, if you just had a few minutes with someone, and let's say this was maybe second or tier down in the organization, but you know, one of your reports or their direct reports really wanted you to meet this person. It was maybe a strategy position or someone that was going to be around for 50 years, right, as you grew out the company. If you just had a few minutes, what do you zero in on? What do you ask them? Well, I, um, for, first of all, I focus on a lot on person's energy and authenticity than the actual stories themselves, because the stories, they all sound nice. It's an interview. I look for genuine stories. I look for career scars because we all have them. And if somebody comes across as perfect and flawless, it generally looks disingenuous to me. <laughs> so will you ask them directly what their worst experience was or, you know, what, how does that frame up in your interview? Well, I, I basically ask, um, first of all, I ask, why choose our company? Because the, the way the person chooses to answer that question reveals the emotional undertones. Whether, you know, some people focus on the culinary side of things, some people focus on the family business side of things, some people focus on the global aspect of it. So whatever is top of mind, it, it, it gets revealed through that question. And, and, and then I ask, what are they most proud of? Because that shows what is so important to them. And uh, people choose stories that they will never forget because it's an instant question looking for an instant answer. Uh, the top of mind stuff comes comes up pretty quickly. And then um, I also focus a lot on how they manage change. And I ask for some examples because at the end of the day, managing change is the most complex and the most valuable probably activity in any company and any job. So how a person approaches change tells a lot about their leadership preferences in my view. Sarat, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much. We always ask one final question, uh, particularly for those in our middle market audience that are aspiring like you, whether through a corporate career or perhaps their own enterprise to you know, take on that corner office position. You know, what kind of career and life advice you know, do you give to someone who, who really has their eyes on becoming CEO of their, of their employer or perhaps uh, building one in the future? That's a great question, Brand. Actually, um, I made a speech uh, recently, earlier this year in uh, University of Michigan in Ross School of Management, and I've been asked the same question by the students. So um, I I'm going to give the answer that I have given them. I would focus on three things. One of them is follow your heart, go where it feels right, not where it makes sense. Because life, I believe, is too short to do things that we don't love. Uh, second advice I would give is Invest time to connect with people because people are at the center of everything we do. And having good relationships with multiple people will take you a long way in your career. There's going to be times we're going to be conflicted in our thoughts. There's going to be times we disagree with people. There's no reason to lose good relations with people because we have different views. So we have to nurture those relationships very carefully. And uh, last but not the least, control your ego. That's what I told them, because the more successful you become, the more difficult, but more important it gets to be humble and to allow space for others. Like as a senior leader, if you want to overwhelm the organization, you can. You have the power to do so, but nobody will be inspired and motivated by your overwhelming presence. So controlling that ego and being able to support in the background and allowing space for the team is a critical skill to gain. As, as you move up. Mr. Adamsal, CEO of Don Foods, thank you so much for sharing your journey into the corner office with us today. Thank you very much, Brent. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode. 